All right. Um, oh, thanks, everyone. Sorry, Christian. Um, as Christian already said, my name is Jordan Daliso. Um, I work here as a salt operator and as a software developer. I'm sitting with Christian in the office. I'm also doing my PhD at the University of the Lead Butter Strand. And it's, it's really a pleasure to, to come and talk to you um, this evening about galaxy cluster environment and member galaxies. Um, so <clears throat> just, uh, uh, sorry. That's an outline of my talk, sorry for that. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the history of the universe following the 21 centimeter cosmology phenomenon. And on that, I'll focus mainly on the first stars and galaxies. And then I'll go on to large scale structures, which in turn uh, are homing um, these really big systems, which are galaxy clusters. I'll talk a bit about the mass budget inside of, of galaxy clusters, why are these important astrophysics and how are, are they observed? And I'll touch base on my research a little bit later on, on, on the ABEL triple galaxy cluster. So, um, so on the introduction of the, of the talk, the history of the universe. So this is one of the leading theories in explaining how the universe began, which is called the Big Bang Theory. So the universe starts there and today we are here. So I'm mostly focusing on this part, which is called the Dark Ages, um, which happened approximately 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So the universe goes dark at this point, However, the cold dark matter, which I highlight in red because I'm going to talk a little bit about it on the next slide, had already formed regions of dense and empty structure, which was affecting baryons. And as these baryons fell towards these potentials, they started emitting some radiation because they, they falling into, into something. And thus they, they gave birth to the first stars and galaxies leading to this really beautiful thing called the cosmic web. Um, so every dot you see here, it's a galaxy, and this is where the interesting stuff, the galaxy cluster starts. Um, the galaxy cluster is sitting on the knots of these filaments, which is this high substructure of sheets and voids. So you've got your, your, your galaxies that are randomly distributed within these, um, these um, filaments in the cosmic web. And if I just explain a little bit about this 21 centimeter cosmology. So this is how the universe looks today. And if you're looking back, you're going back in time. Um, you're going back to sort of where the universe started. You've got your cosmic microwave background, dark ages, the epoch of reionization, and the, and the, and the cosmic web here. Um, so just touch base on the cold dark matter. This is a mysterious type of matter, which is making up 85% of the matter in the universe. And it's been deemed as dark because it doesn't appear to be interacting um, with the electromagnetic field. So it means it doesn't absorb, reflect, or do anything except gravitational. Um, um, and it's composed of as yet undiscovered subatomic particles, such as WIMS, which is the weakly interactive massive particles or axions. And the evidence of these is that um, the galaxies wouldn't be looking the way they're looking if there wasn't this type of matter or they would be moving in the way they're currently moving if this matter wasn't there. So here I'm putting just a plot that's uh, I pulled straight from a paper. So, you take observations and you model a rotation curve, which is essentially how the matter moves around the galaxy when you're moving from the center of the galaxy out to right? So these dots with error bars here 
is the observed rotation curve of this galaxy, NGC 6503. However, you can still break the galaxy into, into its um, constituents, say the disk and the gas, because the galaxy is it's, um, it's out of gas, dust, and stars. What astronomers found is that when you're actually adding these two, you don't get what the observations give you. So there has to be a matter that's missing. And that's where they come with this. So this is the dark matter halo that sort of accounts for the missing um, type of matter. So that's part of um, the evidence is that um, there is a matter that we hockey. We, we don't know anything about. So it's there, but we can't see it. No, we well, assume it's there. Yeah, we assume it's there, but we can't see it. Um, even the current generation of telescopes are not um, powerful enough to actually um try uh, to to actually observe these um the 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 experiment at sen um they've also tried to also um get these subatomic particles but i don't think they have really succeeded in that so it's still really mysterious okay. mm -hmm. um, so you said you think it'll be this pretty simple so this is weekly, weekly interactive massive particles. Really interactive. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's those are the waves. And, and and I mean the definition of those is that it, it's just like a constituent of, of dark matter. They, they we still like really unsure of these subatomic particles because none of the particles that have been studied seem to have any of these um um they don't show any of the signs of, 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 of these dark matter particles. So they, they came up with, with these. Um, so going next um, on the cosmic web. So I've pointed initially that this is the highest substructure of filaments, sheets and voids. And in this image here, this is um, an image um, from the illustry simulations. Again, every dot here is a galaxy. In yellow, we see the bionic matter, which is what makes um, living organisms your, your normal matter. Um, and then you've got like these really dark um, patches here, which I avoid. Got these um, nice filaments here. We find the galaxy clusters on the nodes of these, where these things sort of interact. And every little dot, you see there is a galaxy and not a star. And again, um, the galaxies are, are randomly distributed uh, um, along these filaments. There's, there's no sequence really of how galaxies are. So the, the, the home galaxy, um, which I highlight in red, I'll talk about a bit later, um, which is the Milky Way, our home galaxy, it's said to sit in one of the largest voids, which is the K the KBC void. Um, so this is just like a part of, of these large scale structures, um, the cosmic, the cosmic web. Um, so here so do, do we know what the, what 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 is inside the voids? Or inside the voids, there can be galaxies, but we don't know for sure. So um, as Christian has pointed initially that I, I operate salt, I've seen people actually observing galaxies that are sitting inside the voids. Okay. Yes, yeah. So there's absolutely galaxies within these voids, but um, I think you can't really see them maybe from an image or something, but if you actually point your telescope and give it like some long exposure times, you can actually get something out of this. There could be more, there could be less, we don't, we don't really know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there, there, there's, there's, uh, we've got one astronomer actually here on site that studies these. Alexei Kanaiza is is studying the, the the void galaxies, and when I asked him about these, he said, um, I think they contain some really um, good information on on the on the um, chemical evolution of galaxies and stuff like that because they sort of feeding this. Okay. Yeah, he's studying that. And um, what I'm just showing here with this video is um, when you're zooming in into the industry simulation. So the, the numbers here is just simulations basically. You've got this box and then you start throwing particles that you think would give what you're looking for, right? Because you're simulating this um, 
And then when, as you zoom in, you can start really seeing these, um, I'm not sure if you can see clearly, but um, you've got these dots here, which are your galaxies, and you've got the galaxy clusters sitting there, which are these largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe, um, groups of galaxies bound together by the force of gravity. And yeah, so that was just um, a video of the cosmic web. And going forward, so onto galaxy clusters. So these are known to be the largest, largest known gravitationally bound objects in the universe. And typically they range from hundreds to thousands of galaxies bound together by the force of gravity. And they have really proven to be important laboratories to study the environmental effects on the galaxies that are within these clusters. Um, because these individual galaxies, they tend to undergo some various mechanisms as they move through the cluster. So galaxies are not actually static, they're actually moving into these clusters. So what I'm showing here, it's an image of the Abel 3408 cluster, which I'm studying for my PhD. And every dot, is a galaxy there, except for these with the spikes, these are the stars, because you have a ground-based telescope and you, you, you point into this galaxy cluster, but it obviously passes through the, your, your own galaxy to get there. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously getting these, but um, all those- yeah, with no, like interference. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So all those with no spikes are actually galaxies, they come in different shapes, You've got little fuzzy ones, you've got really tiny ones, you've got ones that are sort of extended here. Um, you've got interacting galaxies um, within these clusters. So that's um, that's just like an optical image of the Abel 3408 galaxy cluster that I'm studying. Um, and these environmental effects um, I'm talking about. So as, as the galaxies are, privacy, the intra-cluster medium, because you've got galaxies that are sitting within this, and you've got an intra-cluster medium, which is some sort of gas that's sitting inside the cluster, and galaxies are either falling towards the cluster or falling out. And as, as they do all these, they, they go into some processes, and these tend to disturb their shape or the, and the mass of the galaxy, and the rim pressure stripping, which is highlighted on this nice cartoon um, by Arei Shang um, is, is, is deemed to be one of the most significant of, of these mechanisms in galaxy clusters um, because, so as the galaxy is falling towards, so what room pressure stripping is essential is that as the galaxy is falling towards the center of the cluster, it gets its gas stripped out by this intercluster medium. So you get, um, um, this rim pressure stripping, that's the gas, um, it's the interstellar medium of the galaxy, you can see it's losing it there. This is the intracluster medium, which is sort of coming towards the galaxy, the galaxy is falling, and the galaxy will pr probably end up here, so it's starving because it's got no gas and it stars. Um, you've got things like thermal evaporation, um, you've got galaxy, galaxy encounters, another galaxy could be traveling out, the other one traveling in, and they, they collide. You've got also galaxy harassment where you've got one big galaxy and you've got other galaxies that are actually sucking gas out of it. Um, so these are the environmental effects and galaxy clusters have really given useful insights of sort of revolutionize our understanding of what's happening inside these clusters to these member galaxies. Um, yeah, so inside of the clusters, as I've mentioned before, 85% of the cluster is the mysterious technical dark matter, 10 to approximately 10 to 15% of the mass is the hot ionized plasma, which is the intracluster medium, um, and, and the rest being the luminous matter which is what we know. So we know really little about these objects. And what I'm showing here is uh, the bullet cluster, so collision of two clusters. And shown in pink is, um, so this is 
um, a composite image. These are a Chandra X-ray observations, pink, and you've got the Magellan and the Hubble Space, or oh, sorry, um, the Hubble Space Telescope in, um, in so the sort of like orange colors that's coming from the from the Hubble Space Telescope. Sorry again for that. So this is known to be one of, um, I think it's the second most energetic incident after the Big Bang, um, two clusters colliding. And the blue here is the dark matter. And I've mentioned that you can't see dark matter. So you might want to know how, how we, we see it now here. So this is coming from gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing is another phenomenon of studying light. So you say, if there's a mass here and you want to study a galaxy behind this mass, the, 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 the light from the galaxy gets bent around. So that's what gravitational lensing is. So this dark matter they put in this image comes from, from that phenomenon of gravitational lensing. Um, it's another it's another way of actually studying um, the dark matter in, in galaxies, and this shows that. Um, so in pink, you've got your normal matter, and you can see how well it's called the bullet because of this little thing that looks like a bullet here. But you can see that the dark matter is not it's, it's sort of acting differently to your normal matter. The normal matter gets split up, but the dark matter is sort of spread throughout um, this. So. These are the, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's another sign that this, this type of matter, we don't know anything about it. It's acting different to the matter that we know about, which is the, the bionic matter. Um, yeah, so again, here you've got every little thing you see is a galaxy except for these, which are, are your stars. Um, you see, so you've got bar, bar, bar galaxies, you've got, um, round ones, you've got little dwarf galaxies, and all these, um, it's just the evolution, like how galaxies evolve from one state to another, either being going through these environmental effects I've just spoken about, or, or on their own. Yeah, so that's the bullet trust. And so why are these um, important or interesting? So they, they, they ideal laboratories to, to, to study, um, to quantify the distribution of dark matter in galaxies. So um, the plot I showed of, of, the, of the velocity field, the way you model the dark matter, that can actually tell you how much dark matter there is in your galaxy, even without having to observe or trying to observe the dark matter with a telescope that can tell you that. Um, once you model the dark matter successfully with dark matter profile, and then you can sort of try and quantify the, the distribution of dark matter. They're also really um, useful in chemical evolution, which is literally um, when were the first elements formed or the evolution of stars and hot gas. Um, the formation and evolution of the large scale structures, which are these um, cosmic filaments. Yeah, some people actually study clusters to actually try and understand the formation and the evolution of these large scale structures. Um, also, the cosmological constraints. So, these are your H1 mass function or your, your, your cosmological functions. If you want to constrain these, um, people have actually studied um, galaxy clusters, constrain those. So this is what I did um, for my masters, studying the velocity distribution um, using dark matter, which is the plot I showed before, where I'm showing the, the different rotation curves and modeling the rotation curve of, 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 of the, the input of the dark matter in the galaxy. That's what I did. Some um, people study temperature and density distribution of the hot gas. Um, within these clusters and, uh, and the gravitational lensing, which is something I just spoke about in the previous slide. Yeah. Um, and where do we all live in this? So we live in a spiral galaxy, it's called the Milky Way. And the sun is one of the 400 billion stars making up this galaxy. And our galaxy is one of the approximately 30 to 50 galaxies making up a local group not a cluster. So that's um, that's the Milky Way there, that's the sister galaxy called the Andromeda galaxy, and you've got another galaxy called the Triangulum galaxy or M33. 
So they forming a group with, with all the other galaxies, they forming a group that's called the local group. And why is this not called the local cluster? Because there's only like a few galaxies. Remember, clusters sort of start from 100 to. So these are only about the 30 or so. So there's groups and then there's galaxies. Yeah. So that's the, the Milky Way galaxy where we all are. Um, and on the observations of these, so early 1990s, um, you know, the, we started with the ground-based observatories, but they're obviously very limited. So here I've got the redshift, which is um, very similar to your Doppler effect, if I can put it like that. You've got your ambulance passing by, and as, as it goes through, the serum dies, die, um, the, 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 the serum dies, dies down. Yeah, so the redshift is in the same phenomenon, but in terms of wavelength. Um, so you've got redshift one, which is at about 600 billion years. So this is um, currently, and then if you go back, sort of trying to go back to the Big Bang where it all started. So the ground-based telescopes are really, really limited. Um, they can, can only observe up to, to redshift of about one or so, and then, mid 1990s, um, they, they deployed the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, which went up and it really gave us um, another view of the universe because it could even probe deeper up to redshift four, which is 1.5 billion years. And after the missions, um, so these are the service missions of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is actually orbiting the head. Um, after they, 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 those missions, it could even go even deeper. And then we, we had um, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Infrared, which went up to Redshift um, 10. So these have really been iconic. Or it sort of set up a hunting ground for scientists to sort of really study galaxies, um, from really deep in the universe, trying to understand all sorts of things, be it galaxy evolution, the formation of these large scale structures, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, this is an outdated image. It says the future, but the James Webb telescope is actually um, up there and it's doing wonders. It's even go, it's going deeper than the, the Hubble Space Telescope and it's already, given us like really, really nice images um, of um, above redshift 10. Um, these. So yeah. And then just, um, I thought I should just point um, some differences on, on the ground the space telescope. So this is showing um, the same region of the sky of a ground space telescope. This is a Subaru. I think it's an eight meter telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope, um, a 2.4 meter camera. So you can see there's a huge difference in resolution if you look into these images. Um, that's an image of a galaxy, I'm assuming. Um, you have from the ground space telescope is sort of really blare, but here you start seeing the little details um, from the space telescope. And if you even zoom in to that little patch, um, you can barely see any structure there. You can see the pixels, but with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can actually see that there's some arms there, there's a little um, stars or bridge of gas here. That, that could be like uh, a little dwarf galaxy close to these big galaxy that's interacting with it or just neighboring. Um, so that's just um, some, some, um, some, some comparisons. So for, with the space um, telescopes, we're really getting detailed observations and good seeing. And this good seeing is really just a measure of um, how sharp or how sharp the observations are or how stable the atmosphere is on a given night. 
and it said for the space telescope, it's so the lower the number, the better the observations. So this is measured in arc seconds. Um, if you've got um, apparently this was at 0 0.8 arc seconds, which I think is good on a given night, 0 0.8 arc seconds, but the space can even go to 0 0.08 arc seconds, which is way, way, way good. So, yeah. And yeah, just touching base on my research, I really thought I'll just show one slide on this. I'm not gonna be too technical. So what I'm doing for my research, I'm using um, near catch observations of the Abel Crafor 8 galaxy cluster. Um, and what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to understand what are the effects that this very dense environment of the galaxy cluster has on these individual galaxies, but from a dynamical point of view. So I'm developing up a semi-automated pipeline to model the dynamics of the individual galaxies and look for any unusual behavior from these. Um, then we could maybe infer from that that this is probably due to the dense environment of, um, of the galaxy cluster. So what I'm showing here, this is um, just a map of, of the Abel Grifol 8 observed with the Meerkat. So it sees in, in radio, it sees in radio wavelengths. So this is just like the array. Um, this is, um, we've got the array and DAC, and these are just the units showing, like the color bar showing the units of, um, of um, the flux in, in H1, gen skis. Um, Jensky hats, maybe, yeah, of this galaxy cluster. So what we did here is that we we took the cluster and we tried to identify the the individual galaxies we can find within using a source finding um, software that was um, developed and it's, it's been used successfully in astronomy. And we found about sixty four galaxies um, in H one. Um, so these are the galaxies that I'm showing here, that's 64 detections in the galaxy cluster. And you can start seeing some really weird structures, like a sort of like a tadpole or a jellyfish there. You can see like a round galaxy, quite big. Um, but then you can also see these really little dwarf galaxies um, that um, are part of this cluster. And what I'm showing in blue here is the rear radius. <clears throat> so what this rear radius is that galaxies get bound together by gravity, but they don't get into one thing. They can get into one galaxy because there's also pressure which is pushing outwards. So when the pressure gets approximately equal to the gravity that is pulling these, then you call like that. Then we start saying, okay, this galaxy cluster is realized. So it's got in that state. That, stable. Yeah, it's got to be stable. Yeah, so that's the rear radius. So everything outside there is either still moving towards um, the galaxy cluster is moving away. You know, but um, yeah, so that's what I'm doing for, for my research. And just to end my talk, um, these. Systems, they really hold a handful of insights on distribution of dark matter. They serve as great laboratory to study the evolution of galaxies. I find them amazing, really, and take home and stay in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for, for that interesting presentation, and I'm sure there are questions. I did a question which I wasn't going to ask. Is that uh, you indicated that it was hot, hot ionized plasma? Yes. Is that the leftovers from a supernova? Or, or and another is how hot is the hot? This is 340,000 for the new number. Um, I think a few thousands Kelvin, actually, uh, yeah.
uh, so 2,000, I think 3,000 or I can't remember, but it's, yeah, it's quite hard. Um, I can I can really quantify put a number to it, really. But yeah, it's it's a it's a hot ionized plasma. I can't really say if it's a leftover from a supernova or what. Yeah, I haven't really looked that far. Yeah, I wouldn't like to. <clears throat> I, I have a tricky question at the moment. Given that you uh, emphasize the dark core meta so much, on the scale from zero, completely unsurprised, to 10, very surprised, how surprised would you be if it turns out that dark matter does not exist and there is a flaw in the general relativity? Eight out of 10, <laughs> <laughs> Not in your last group. <laughs> <laughs> now, those galaxies that we're now looking at, I'm sure you're not going to live for another million years. So, um, are you putting that into a, um, what do you call it, into a, um, a, a computer model to see if they move out or in or how? Yeah, I said. So because you you getting um you getting limited time obviously with the with a telescope so these are real observations from a telescope it's not um it's not a simulation so you just get a pointing and get the data it's just like that so it's hard to tell really from just like an image if they're moving or mm -hmm. or not but what we know and from previous studies of this cluster is that the real radius is there so. The galaxies that are within the real, the real radius, the real radius, we say they realize. So we hope they see that. It could be that they'll move. You never know the, the universe. It, it does its own thing, really. So, yeah. Will we, will we be able to see that in, in our lifetime that they move? Uh, I highly doubt it. No, I highly doubt it. Yeah, because the time scales of these yeah, are, quite, are quite stretched out. So, yeah, we wouldn't. Yeah. So we'll put it into a computer model. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. How did you decide to choose Abel 3408? So there was, so that the motivation behind this was that just close to this galaxy cluster, there was a lens um, candidate. So close to this galaxy cluster, um, I'm, I'm, Pete, I'm not showing the image now there is um, what seems to be a lens candidate, right? So the, the motivation behind the observation of the cluster and the lens candidate was to confirm if there is lens. But um, the person that was doing this, which is um, my former supervisor's PhD student, found that there's actually no lens candidate. So since then, we've actually saw other opportunities to use the cluster or the data for other things, which is why, um, yeah, I'm studying that, yeah. How far is this, the center of this cluster away from us? This is 184 megaparsecs. Yeah, so we're using these in astronomy is um, <laughs> pretty far. Yeah, it's quite spread out. Yeah, yeah. So it's 184 megaparsecs. And that's there. the whole body as a, a whole move away, expanding, but individually you could have some of them inside that cluster moving relative towards us. Very, but, very. But, but they go collectively. Yeah, away than anything can move towards. That's them. actually a very, a very nice comment. Yeah, so, so this is just an image showing the flux. I've got another image like this, which shows the velocities of these individual galaxies, and we really see the velocity gradient. So the galaxies here seem to be moving at higher speeds, meaning that they're moving away from us, and these ones on the top here. They seem to be moving towards. Yeah. So we've actually had an attempt of trying to, to generate a rotation curve of this, but we, we did not succeed with the current software. Need more time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question on Zoom. 
from research, if you can try to unmute yourself and ask. And can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Richard. Okay, good. Uh, the question is, with gravitational lensing, does it affect all frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum equally? Ooh, I'm not expert on that field. I'm, I'm sorry, Richard. Uh, I can't really say. Yeah. Okay, no problem. The, the talk was very interesting, by the way. Thanks, Richard. I, I have another question. If I may, you, you said at, towards the end of your presentation that you've got the gravitation pulling the cluster together yeah. and you've got pressure. Is that thermal pressure? Sorry? Is that thermal pressure which is resisting? Um, I think that's that's the pressure from the intracluster medium. So the intracluster medium is sort of attacking these galaxies as they move, if I, if I can put it in raw terms like that. So that's the pressure from the intracluster media mm -hmm. within. Yeah, yeah. So it's the pressure of the intracluster media. Thank you. 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 Thank you.